Hey everybody, it's Eugene Lee Show and welcome to Forensics Talks. This is episode 54 and my guest today is James Wigmore, who's a forensic toxicologist. Now, before we get started, as usual, I'd just like to make a couple of quick announcements. And of course, uh, many of you who are going to be watching today uh, maybe from different places of the world or whatever. So by all means, go ahead and type into the comments section where you're from. I always like to know where uh, folks are watching. And of course, if you have any questions along the way, also post those in there and I'll try to uh, get them over to our guest today as well. So um, a few things uh, that I wanted to uh, just bring up here. And the first one is that I do have a course that's coming up and this is a photogrammetry course that i've just announced we already have people who've signed up and so if you are interested in photogrammetry learning how to use your digital camera to document evidence in 3d there's a course coming up on february 22nd and 23rd of this month so it's coming up it's just around the corner you can just go to ai2-3d.com slash photogrammetry and you can sign up and i'll put this up at the end also there is the IAFSM ACER conference. So this is the International Association of Forensic and Security Metrology and the Association of Crime Scene Reconstruction. And this is a conference that's happening on February 14th to 20th. Actually, that's not the 28th, uh, that'd be a heck of a long conference, uh, but that is coming up on the 2022, just around the corner. I'm gonna be teaching the basic laser scanner certification course. And that is um, something for people who are doing, you know, crime scene documentation with the laser scanner and also so um, I'll be doing a workshop there on bloodstain pattern analysis. So if you're interested, just go to IAFSM.org and, uh, you know, you can get some more details, register, whatever it is that you like. Perfect. All right. So today we're going to get started. And uh, my guest today is James Wigmore. And James has worked as a forensic toxicologist for over 29 years at the Center of Forensic Sciences in Toronto, or he was. Um, he testified in over 700 criminal cases throughout Canada and in numerous personal injury civil cases and coroner's inquests. He's published over 70 scientific articles in the forensic toxicology area, uh, which have been cited by the, Su uh, the Supreme Court of Canada and the High Court of South Africa. He's written numerous books, a couple of them I'll show you a little bit later, and as well as three books on the medical legal, medical legal aspects of alcohol and cannabis. Uh, his next book will be on nicotine and vaping, and I'm going to ask him about some of that today. Jim's been interviewed on the CBC and other media on issues arising out of the legalization of cannabis in Canada and on vaping, and he was on the expert panel of Health Canada on public information regarding cannabis. He received a prestigious Jerome Award from the Canadian Society of Forensic Sciences for outstanding contributions to the field of forensic science, and I'm just going to bring him in here. So there he is. Hi, James. How are you doing? Hi, Eugene. Very well. Uh, th thanks for inviting me on your show. I'm looking forward well, to it. Yeah, pleasure to have you, and I really appreciate it. So whenever I, I do these kinds of talks, um, this is one that's like way out of my wheelhouse, okay? Because I'm, I'm not, <laughs> not a chemist. I'm not a you know biologist. I'm, I never liked chemistry. <laughs> I was more on the physics side and math and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, I, I've done a bit of research here, and but I'm really going to be counting on you to sort of educate me in a number of areas. Um, the, the first thing that I want to ask you about is yourself and, and sort of the, your career path. A lot of times we have people who are in um, school or in university and they're thinking about a career, maybe in toxicology, or, you know, chemistry or whatever. And I'm just wondering, what was your path into um, toxicology? Well, it was very unusual because um, I started at the forensic lab in 1976. So we didn't have any CSI. There was no forensic courses offered at the U of T or any, I think, university in, in Toronto. So it's changed quite a bit. So basically, I, I started there as a technician. And for the first couple of years, what I did is I repaired all the breathalyzers used in Ontario by the police officers. So that was the old um, green box with the potassium dichromate solution invented by uh, Professor Borkenstein. So when I was doing that, I caught fire and I was became an instructor on the course for um, breathalyzer technicians, a two week course, to train them. And I went to, eventually went back to university and finished my four year degree, which is a minimum requirement for your Bachelor of Science. Unfortunately, the Center of Forensic Sciences uh, used to be downtown, right from the U of T downtown campus. So I'd go over there in my lunch hour or whatever and, and take courses and come back. Eventually got the four-year degree, became a scientist, um, again, was promoted, um, did all sorts of research and published papers and, and went to court um, numerous, numerous times um, about uh, breath alcohol testing. So it's an unusual path. Um, 
there was a few people at the lab at the time that did the same thing where they started as technicians. So you don't need a, a full qualifications and then were able to upgrade the qualification, and become a scientist. Uh, but it's an unusual type of uh, path nowadays. Typically, they want for a toxicologist a PhD to start with. And um, unless you can do it through the technician way like I did. Right. Um, so let's talk about forensic toxicology. And um, if you had if you had to explain toxicology to somebody like me, OK, or to somebody that wasn't really aware what it was, what would you say is the primary role of toxicology, at least in a forensic context? Yes, the toxicology is um, the science of looking at the adverse effects of drugs and poisons on the human body. Pharmacology and pharmacy and that is looking at the beneficial effects of the various drugs. But a toxicologist is looking at the uh, detrimental effects of the drug. And forensic, all that means on, on court a lot. Uh, so forensic toxicology. So it's basically toxicology related to medical legal situations or the law, basically. Okay. Now, what, were there any particular areas that you that you sort of specialized in over the years or areas of focus that you've studied that are your primary sort of things that you talk about? Oh, yes. My primary um, passion or the um, what I uh, the drug I really focused on for, for quite a few years was alcohol. Um, some way has said that alcohol is but distilled crime. And if you're going to go into forensic toxicology, you have to know alcohol inside out because that's 90% of the drugs in, in you know, homicides or sexual assaults or in medical legal corners cases, such as um, a person falls off a bridge or the snowmobile goes through the ice, um, car, uh, car accidents, of course, impaired causing death, uh, very serious accidents. It's all involved, 90% uh, of the time involves alcohol. So you have to, if you wanna to go to forensic toxicology, in some ways you could just call it forensic alcohol toxicology, but that would, um, you know, that would get rid of, uh, uh, remove all the other drugs, but alcohol by far, you have to know. Yeah, I, I was just thinking like, especially with some of the cases I work on, it's incredible to see how many times people are under some kind of influence of a drug or drinking alcohol, whatever it might be, whenever a crime is committed or there's some kind of serious accident or, or something like that. Probably a lot more than we realize, I think. I'm not sure what your experience has been. Yeah, it's a, it's a quite a, quite a large number. Um, typically, uh, if you have a single motor vehicle accident at night on the weekend, almost invariably alcohol is involved. Yeah. Well, let me. Let, we're, I think today I wanted to focus on a couple of things, and uh, well, a few things actually. And one of them was going to be nicotine. And nicotine is sort of the ones that you know I, I understand more because you know growing up, uh, you know, I've seen the transition and the changes and attitudes change from nicotine but if we had to go back in time um was was nicotine something that just kind of crept up on people like nobody really knew because people were just smoking or were was there some sort of um you know medical use for nicotine early on well nicotine actually it's, it's interesting it's one of the few drugs that have has come from the new world um from north america um cannabis is from basically from china and asia and india and alcohol is uh, Northern European, basically, um, beer and, and, and all this uh, wine and all that stuff. But uh, nicotine uh, was, uh, was um, cultivated by the native groups, especially in South America, it started uh, in the Andes, probably. And the, the uh, tobacco plant um, um, was, uh, was cultivated by them and designed by the, the uh, native groups to provide more and more nicotine, because nicotine's the drug that's the important part of tobacco. If it wasn't for nicotine, no one would be smoking, no one would be vaping, because it's a very highly addictive compound. Um, it's interesting, in forensic toxicology, we don't really deal too much of, with nicotine uh, because it's considered more like um, a long-term chronic effect. Um, like you, you basically don't get impaired driving if you use nicotine. So um, we sort of like ignored it, but. I remember with all the years that we worked at the uh, worked at the lab, we would do drug screens and routinely nicotine would be found in a lot of the drug screens. And we basically just said, well, the person's a smoker or he vaped or whatever. Right. But I think there's a lot more uh, involved with nicotine, especially in the forensic area that I think the forensic toxicologist should get involved with um, than is uh, is prone. And that's the uh, all this is a result of my book. Like initially, uh, when I talked to other forensic toxicologists, uh, they felt that the next book I should do is opioids or some other drug. They couldn't believe I'd do nicotine. Um, but when I got more and more involved in it, I found nicotine was a basic, basically, it's like um, 
the tip of the iceberg. You know, we, we don't see a lot in forensic toxicology, which we should. Uh, nicotine is a neurotoxin. It's, um, it's the most poisonous of the drugs. It, actually, it's about 200 times more poisonous than alcohol and vastly more poisonous than, than THC or, or cannabis. So mm. it is an extreme poisonous drug. It's also absorbed through the skin. So um, what people have been doing for vaping um, is they have the liquid nicotine that they put in the vaping um, fluid. And if you spill it on your skin, nicotine will be absorbed and it'll cause all sorts of, um, of um, uh, nausea, vomiting, and um, uh, rapid heart rate, uh, things like that. And it has been used. Uh, uh, There's one uh, case, I think it was in New York, where um, an exchange couple, this guy, um, filled up his water gun with nicotine liquid from uh, from the thing and his wife he sprayed her all over and she developed this uh, horrible reaction I had to go to hospital and they had to treat her uh, initially they thought it was some a russian nerve gas but it was just nicotine which is a neurotoxin too in some ways it's quite as effective as, as that so it is much more toxic it also is very addictive um so basically in the early stages before the europeans came they, you're wondering, well, why didn't natives develop um, lung cancer and mm -hmm. the addiction? And the reason is the tobacco they grew uh, was very um, basic. So it was very bitter. Like most drugs give you a bitter taste. That's usually it's a, 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 a indication that you, there is a drug in your drink or whatever is a bitter taste. Typically it is. But anyways, it's very bitter. So basically the natives would not inhale it into their lungs. They would just absorb it through the oral cavity because you can absorb alcohol like chewing tobacco. So they puff on it, but keep the puff inside their mouth and not inhale it into their lungs. So they didn't develop the extreme addictions and the um, and the uh, also the the cancers that we developed. The cancers didn't come until basically cigarettes came, and um, that was much later. And it was uh, and what happened is the companies um, found that nicotine was very addictive. Uh, but it was very averse to get into your system. So they designed cigarettes to make them more acetic, not basic, mm -hmm. to add flavoring to them, give a milder taste, and also to allow you to inhale deeper. So the longer do they want you to puff, because the nicotine level you got from puffing only went up very, uh, you know, uh, very low and at a very low rate. When you inhale it, it's almost like intravenous injection. In fact, there's some indication you get uh, more of a hit with nicotine initially than you do get from morphine intravenously. Um, so it's, so it it's a, fast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When you're smoking it, it's oh, extremely, extremely fast. And that's mm. what people are craving for. So the cigarettes developed basic to to have people addicted to make them um, use um, cigarettes. And the good thing for the companies is that nicotine leaves your system very quickly. So about an hour or so, half the level goes. So that's why people smoke, you know, once uh, about once an hour or so, um, and they'll smoke a full cigarette, which is about um, uh, ten puffs to to each cigarette. So if you're talking about a pack of cigarettes, twenty cigarettes, ten puffs to a cigarette, that's two hundred hits of a drug you're putting in your body, and you mm -hmm. wonder it is so addictive. And um, it's you know, it's a, the trouble is too is people inhale all this into the body and you get cancers. And in 19, I think 1910, 1920, cancers first started uh, occurring, lung cancer. Uh, there's um, pathologists who are all excited about, I think it was 1910 or something, or, 50, or 50, 1915. The guy was going to see his first pathologist, first lung cancer related death ever. And he rushed over to see it because he thought we'd never see this case again, lung cancer again. And what happened, of course, is the smoking craze came in, the advertising, all the worst things you can think of a, a large companies to make money off of people's misery, addiction mm -hmm. and uh, a death. Yeah, interesting. And uh, I, I heard somewhere, and I don't know if this is true, but I heard that on its own, nicotine is not as, um, what's the word, it, it maybe addictive or harmful. Carcinogenic. As a, or carcinogenic, potentially, yeah. because there's like, I heard as many as thousands of chemicals that are produced when you smoke it, when you burn it. Yeah, yeah. But nicotine's the one that's the addiction. Um, mm. Nicotine, supposedly, um, and it's a bit controversial, doesn't cause lung cancer, but it does promote lung cancer. So you have carcinogens in the cigarette smoke, which will cause the lung cancer. Nicotine will promote its peripheration all throughout the body. And that's why you see sometimes you see a lot of cigarette smokers initially have the cancer in the lungs 
but it pr spreads to the brain because of the influence of nicotine, uh, which uh, which is of course horrendous. But um, yeah, it's not uh, as uh, cancer causing as, as tobacco specific nitrosamines. Okay. Now you mentioned, you know, that it's absorbed through the skin and such. And in order for people to get off of, you know, the nicotine, I mean, of course there's uh, gums, right? There's gums you can chew, yep. there's patches that people put yep. on. Um, and then there's vaping. So, um, but I, I'm not sure, is vaping a, a, a path out of smoking for some people? Yeah, again, that's controversial. I, I don't think it is because basically the habit is you're doing this 200 times a day, um, a, a, a place, um, a cigarette or a vaping device like Juul is designed that the tank will last for 200 hits. So it's basically designed after the cigarette. So you're basically doing this all the time. Then you change it to vape. You're doing the same thing all the time. So the same behavior is occurring. The best ways of, um, you should see a, an expert on it, but the best ways are using a patch and gum together. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the patch gives you a long background of nicotine level. So you're not going to develop the craving as much. And the gum will give you a, a quick burst of nicotine to keep you on track. And then, of course, you need other other treatment. There's there's also uh, drugs that um, uh, the main one of the main drugs is antidepressant antidepressant to uh, allow people to take off nicotine. So, so, so see an expert and definitely get off using cigarettes for sure or any tobacco product and even uh, vaping. There is risks with vaping, although it, so far, it's been minimized because we don't know so much about vaping. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process by which um, people get hooked? Because in, in doing some of the research, it seems like the process is very similar. Like when we look, when we talk about cannabis or alcohol or, or maybe not alcohol, but even opioids and things like that, that, that you know, this, this, um, this mechanism of the receptors in the brain. Yeah. Uh, so what, can you talk a little bit about what's happening there? Yeah, well, each drug has their own basic type of receptors and then affects the whole system. And basically, it's um, it's a serotonin. So it gives you it, it, um, alcohol and nicotine and cannabis. And eventually, they will affect your serotonin level, cause it to rise and cause a uh, feeling of pleasure. So you start to associate the feeling of pleasure with the use of, of the drug. And for all these drugs, the, uh, the worst uh, time that can occur to get addiction is when you're a teenager. So the cigarette companies were always, uh, you know, like Joe Camel and all these other, are always trolling around trying to get young teenagers addicted because um, what um, I've heard some doctors say, they say, you know, lung cancer is a pediatric disease because what happens when you get in your 20s, you don't smoke. You know, it's too adverse to you. So you have to get them addicted when they're young. The same thing with alcohol and with cannabis. So that's why we have um, minimum ages uh, like 19 uh, in the United States for cannabis is 21 to help prevent the, your brain, especially when it's rapidly changing, when you're getting older um, uh, from being come uh, switched uh, into addiction of the drugs, because basically the drugs will modify your brain of long term use. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually a question here from uh, Selma, and uh, I'd just like to bring this up. It's, I think it's an interesting question, but yeah. what, how does nicotine affect other like prescription medication or how does it interact maybe with some other chemicals? Is it fairly benign or can it cause some other issues? Yeah, I'm afraid that's a little bit, um, I don't know about all the, the chemical interactions. I don't think there's that many um, for nicotine. Uh, because the levels you take are such such small levels, um, there may be, but again, you'd have to con consult your your medical doctor. Uh, you know if there are any interactions. So the best thing is is not to have any nicotine at all on board. Right. Well, you know, nicotine is one of those things, though. That um, so, for example, alcohol or other drugs that sort of um, affect you in different ways, uh, sort of emotionally or mentally, or whatever. You know, people would never blame nicotine on. You know, I lost my I can't drive because I was smoking or, you know, I, I lost my mind because I was smoking. So we don't typically don't associate that with nicotine. But I'm just wondering if, you know, if somebody's really s smoking heavily, um, there's going to be some physical effects, right? Potentially very harmful physical effects if you overdose on this stuff. Yeah. And it's not so much a nicotine, but the other components. Um, what happens when you're smoking a cigarette, your carbon dioxide level increases. So there has been study for heavy smokers who have a high carbon monoxide level, which again affects the oxygen going to your brain and um, all your neurons and that. Um, there are some studies, especially there was a Canadian one that showed uh, chronic um, 
heavy cigarette users were more prone to motor, motor vehicle accidents. Um, and even if they uh, kept the amount of alcohol they consumed and everything else the same, that if they used uh, like a like pack a day or two packs a day smokers, they're at a, a greater incidence of uh, motor vehicle accidents. Perhaps it's also due to um, what's been mentioned is distraction, you know, getting the cigarette out and lighting it. Um, they're saying that perhaps the cigarette smoke it gets inside the van, or the car, and causes uh, problems with the uh, seeing the, the, uh, the glare and that. Uh, fortunately, smoking is banned in cars where there's children in. Um, um, and that's the other problem with uh, interesting with nicotine is you have um, third hand smoke. And I think it's much more pervasive than you realize. So nicotine is such a toxic drug and such a, a you know, I mean, basically it's, it's, it has been used for years as a pesticide. And the neonicotinamides are basically a design of the nicotine molecule. To make it really, you know, those are the new um, uh, new pesticides you have. But nicotine by itself is banned as a pesticide because it's too toxic. It just destroys the environment, kills everything, kills birds, bees, everything. So it's no longer allowed in Canada, the United States, and most other countries. So it's it's interesting. We're inhaling, we're we're banning it for the environment, but we're still allowing people to inhale it into their lungs. Um, but the problem with nicotine is it stays around. It um, it's so when you have um, when you inhale, that's uh, you know that's your 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 main smoking. When you exhale the the uh, the uh, smoke, you see the big cloud and you see secondhand smoke and you avoid it. And there's all banned and things like that. But when that smoke disappears, the nicotine and all the other nitrosamines go into the carpet, your coat, your jacket. It, it may not smell, but the nicotine will uh, per, uh, per, perseverate, called third-hand smoke, into the rug and carpet. That was saved for months. And they're saying that if people um, uh, who buy a home of, of um, chronic smokers, when they go in the home, they have elevated nicotine levels, even though they don't smoke, because it's all it's everywhere. You have to really um, steam clean everything and, and thoroughly clean it to get, rid, to get rid of the uh, nicotine and the toxins that are exposed by cigarette smoke. And so when you see the cigarette smoke disappear, it doesn't mean it's no longer toxic. It just uh, it, uh, goes into everywhere. And of course, right. young children are especially at uh, risk because they're crawling around on the rugs. So, and they'll be absorbing the nicotine. And they're a young kid. They're developing their brain quickly. They're more susceptible to nicotine. So it is extremely nasty uh, chemical. Interesting. And with respect to like patches, gums, um, you know, cigarettes and then vaping. Um, vaping is kind of like the, the newer kid on the block. So, it, and I don't know, there's just, just some things I think about vaping. Is, is vaping less harmful than smoking or because you're not burning uh, things? Or would you say it's, it, it's equally as, as... Well, I would say it's a different harmful. Mm. And the problem is that we know the, the problems with cigarettes. We know what cancers they cause. Uh, we know the carbon dioxide things and all these other effects. With vaping, we don't know. And also the vaping changes. Like I think there's a, a couple thousand different types of vapors that you can use. And the problem with the vapors is that they are a heated metal sometimes. And so, so it's, um, uh, you probably know more about this, and like nickel, nickel cadmium uh, 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 things. And so when it's heating up and cooling down, heating up and cooling down, little bits of nic uh, nickel will get out. And they found that in some vapors, the level of nicotine, uh, of nickel, not nicotine, uh, nickel in the blood is much higher than for people who even smoke cigarettes. So it's a different type of harm, I would say. Um, I, I wouldn't, like, I would not recommend someone to switch from, from cigarettes to vaping. I would recommend them to quit altogether. Sure. <laughs> well, that makes sense. Yes. I would agree with you there too. Uh, let's move into, I want to move into the, and I learned this now, it's the alcohols and that includes cannabis, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's a little <laughs> joke I have um, uh, because uh, when I did my uh, research on cannabis, um, like alcohol, the tech, scientific name for alcohol is ethanol. Um, but people just refer to it as alcohol, that's fine. Ethanol, the old L in the end means it's an alcohol. And if you look at THC, if you know what it stands for, it's tetrahydrocannabinol. So if you look at the structure, it has some ring structures, but it's basically is considered an alcohol. So alcohol is a, is a three carbon, um, no, two carbon uh, alcohol. And THC is a 21 carbon alcohol. So you can see in some ways they're both alcohol. So if I'm an alcohol expert, I could jokingly say that I'm also a, a THC expert. But um, but uh, yeah, they both have different effects. Um, alcohol 
so far, I think, is, is the worse drug than uh, THC, at least under current uh, uses. Um, it's interesting. I, I Again, when I was writing my book on cannabis, initially I was against uh, legalization of, of cannabis in Canada. And um, it wasn't until I read all the scientific papers and, and did a lot of research that I realized that the harms of cannabis, especially if it's controlled, um, are actually less than, than alcohol in a lot of ways. Uh, the, uh, the thing we've done in Canada, I think, has been very good. They've, they've controlled the marketing of cannabis just like they do for cigarettes. So basically, you cannot advertise it widely. You have to have special stores. You can't allow kids around. You know, so it's just like selling a cigarette package. Mm-hmm. And they treat the um, impairment um, of cannabis and the laws against THC and, and driving like alcohol. So they sort of like use both uh, both drug models to control it. And they've done it quite successfully. The um, the teenage and, and younger group use of cannabis has actually either stabilized or gone down. I think perhaps it is because um, if your grandpa is smoking weed, it's no longer cool. I mean, hello, mm-hmm. why, your, your grandpa's doing it. Why, why should you do it? You know, so it's no longer the cool drug, and it's no longer illegal. Um, so the, the, you um, you don't have you're not exposed to a, say a drug dealer. You know, before you can only get cannabis with a drug dealer, and they would right. ha- ha- sell you things at the side too, cocaine and all this other stuff. Whereas the legal stores are very good. They're all well-trained. They know about the uh, um, um, problems with with THC and what levels are and all these uh, other factors. So um, as I got more and more involved, I decided, and also it's it's been over three years now since it's been big guys. I think um, it actually, the legalization has gone on very well and the the money has gone away from drug dealers to the government, um, which uh, so we all benefit from it as opposed to uh, illegal criminals, basically encouraging that. So um, yeah, I'm quite um, uh, quite optimistic about uh, cannabis and the they've written the laws too um, for um, impaired driving like they have for alcohol. So for alcohol, the uh, criminal limit is in Canada, uh, 80 milligrams and 100 milliliters of blood. In the states, you recall that 0.08, or people would tell us 0.08. So, in for cannabis or for THC, the limit is uh, two step twofold between two to five nanograms of THC per milliliter of blood. That is a lesser criminal offense. And from a uh, greater than five nanograms per milliliter and above, um, that's a greater criminal offense. So they have a two-level system going on. You have um, the police are uh, able to do drug recognition tests to see if there's any grounds that they can see THC. If they suspect the person has THC in their blood, uh, they can make a demand for a blood sample because the ultimate sample for cannabis uh, to measure impairment is THC in the blood. Okay. And this is another problem where the is the urine um, uh, testing is no good. We don't allow that in Canada for for criminal pur- purposes because uh, basically, if someone uh, smokes a marijuana cigarette, uh, cannabinoid metabolites can be detected for quite a lot, uh, quite a long period of time, and there's showing no impairment. Um, basically, it just shows you. So if you have a positive THC test in the urine, it just means you used it. Mm-hmm. And when a cannabis was illegal, that was a great test because he's doing illegal activity. Why hire him? Um, you know, he's, he's going into all sorts of uh, drug dealers and, and problems. So uh, it was a great test. But now, since it's legal in Canada, many U.S. states that that urine uh, test is is useless, basically, because, yeah, I use it. Well, you drink a beer, too. You drank a beer last night. I smoked right. a joint last night. What's the problem? You're going to be, you know, I'm going to test positive, but in the urine, not in the blood. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, alcohol is something that's obviously familiar with a lot more people and people understand its effects. And if you overdo it on alcohol, it becomes immediately apparent, uh, both in the way you function and some of the after effects as well, uh, which can last, you know, for hours and hours and hours. But uh, cannabis, um, does it have uh, does it have the same kind of effects as alcohol? Because it would seem to me that it's quite different. I mean, uh, growing up, I knew some people that were regular users and they weren't necessarily, you know, they could operate, they could function, uh, you know, they, they would do their thing, but they could do their work, they could do their, their jobs, depending on what it was. But um, how, how is the effect on the body so different between the two? Um, well, basically, both of them are considered depressants, but they act differently um, because cannabis, the THC gets in your body so quickly, and goes in the brain very quickly. And it's fat soluble, whereas alcohol is water soluble. 
So basically, um, um, the THC gets in your brain very quickly from smoking. It leaves the brain very quickly, so the effects disappear. Half-life is about two hours or so, um, whereas with alcohol, it's water-soluble. It gets in your body slowly by drinking, um, and it distributes through all your total body water supply, and uh, it's slowly eliminated at a fixed constant rate by the liver. So you're right, they are different in some ways, but they're both depressant drugs. Um, uh, cannabis tends to leave the system much more rapid. So basically, I think the recommendation of the Canadian Medical Association or, or some medical association in Canada is that do not smoke, do not smoke, do not um, use cannabis within four to six hours prior to driving. So even though after an, uh, an hour or two, the level drops dramatically, uh, tremendously, wait four to six hours before um, uh, driving uh, and the risk will be very, extremely low because can't, uh, THC leaves your system so rapidly. But it does stay in the fat tissues and it does stay in your urine. So because it stays in the urine so long, in Canada, we do not do criminal um, uh, um, impaired driving based on a urine sample. We need the blood sample. Okay. What's the difference between, for example, uh, hemp and regular cannabis? Yeah, that's um, an interesting thing. Basically, um, the cannabis plant was developed into two streams, the uh, stream from India and China, uh, which had a high THC concentration, and the stream in Northern Europe, which is used for rope and for uh, sheets and things like that. It was used as a fiber. So the hemp, as it was then, had virtually no THC. So if you smoked hemp, all you get is a headache. You wouldn't get any impairment whatsoever because it's a low level of THC. What it does have is a high level of um, what some people refer to as a more beneficial cannabinoid, CBD. And CBD doesn't cause any, any impairment. It doesn't give a false positive on the blood THC test. Um, and it, it um, hopefully, well, how, well, in some people, it seems to help them. So it's, again, controversial about the use, but hemp uh, contains virtually no THC, no impairing uh, uh, compounds, and a lot of CBD, um, whereas the cannabis that you get at the uh, cannabis stores in general, or if you grow it, um, like, um, like, like, um, the various, like skunk or those other uh, compounds, they have a very, very high THC. And that's the amazing thing has happened. It, it, when cannabis was, they, they looked at the records of seizures of cannabis over the years, and I think in 1990 or so, the average concentration is 4% THC. And recently, I think 2016, the average is 17%. So it's gone by fourfold. So the cannabis has changed. And in some ways, I, I, I've done a few lectures like uh, that. Uh, I say it's not your granddad's weed anymore. And it's not. It's, it's a lot more high THC concentration. So if your granddad gave you advice about smoking a joint, he's looking at a, a, a cannabis plant that was one quarter of the concentration. So it's like someone saying, well, you can drink a bottle of beer or a bottle of rye, it's the same effect. And it def definitely is not. One's much higher concentration than the other. So mm -hmm. you have to do it. And also uh, what's uh, advancing for cannabis is the edibles. And edibles, I, it's, it's interesting. In, in my research, I find that I would say the vast majority of the problems with cannabis uh, in medical legal situations and also in um, psychiatric situation is due to um, edibles. And the problem is with your, when you're smoking, you can titrate. So you, you feel the effects of THC when you're smoking, you think, whoa, this is strong stuff, so I won't smoke anymore, or I'll smoke less or whatever. You can titrate your level so it doesn't go too crazy. With eating, um, the effects don't appear for an hour or so. So you take a piece, of a brownie um, and wait and wait and wait, there's no effect. So you take another piece, no effect, you take another, and you overdose. And that's what I've seen a lot of that. There was one uh, case in, in Colorado where a naive user, uh, he got a, um, um, a chocolate, a cookie basically. And the cookie said, uh, take one six of, the do of, of this cookie. And so basically the maximum dose you should take if you're new at it is five milligrams. So 2.5 to five milligrams of THC maximum dose when you're starting it. This cookie contained 30 milligrams. So it was correct to saying, well, eat one six. So the guy ate one six, but who's gonna eat a six of a cookie? And he sat around, no effect and no effect. So he ate the whole cookie. So six times that you should have, he developed psychosis, paranoia, all these other effects and fell or jumped off a, a building. So, and that's again, edibles. Whereas if he is smoking, 
he couldn't get to those those levels. So the edibles are are, are a problem. Uh, they also cause problems for 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 children, especially when they're shaped like gummies, because again. Um, children and young kids are much more susceptible to the effects of drugs. So like five milligrams may not affect you, but for a, for a five, six, seven year old child, it's going to have quite a dramatic effect and perhaps right. go to the hospital. So that's the other problem is gummies. In Canada, we've restrict, we, we have restricted it. It has to be properly labeled and child proof. Um, and uh, the maximum uh, in a package can be 10 milligrams. So it kind of restricts it. But there are all sorts of cases of, of, of children being poisoned by THC because they ate a, a whole chocolate bar, which had 100 milligrams of THC or a couple of gummies. And I heard one person said, well, one of these unscrupulous dealers, he said, well, the gummies we make will be vegetable shaped gummies because kids don't eat their vegetables. <laughs> so um, I'm afraid that doesn't work. Uh, you need yeah. child proof resistance and all this other stuff. So there are some problems there. The, the uh, edibles, I think, are the main problem so far. Um, with the uh, with cannabis use, and it's mainly a, a, a learning experience, which is what a program like yours will help. So, so yeah. you know that you know don't eat a whole cookie if it says don't eat the cookie. You know, and and remember the effects will take longer, uh, and also the effects last longer in cannabis um, with, right. when you eat it as opposed to smoking. It doesn't disappear as fast. In uh, in in cases where, for example, you have a victim, you have you know you get somebody who's died or whatever. I'm curious about the latent effects of you know alcohol or cannabis. You know, once if a person's dead, like when you go back and you're you're checking to see like you know what was what was there. Um, is there any um, what are sort of the 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 effects after a person's body shuts down with alcohol and with cannabis? Like, what are some of the after effects? And can you can you work backwards? You post mortem changes or that? Yeah, yeah, in, yeah. kind of. Alcohol is well known, um, and you can actually do back calculations. You can use blood and urine tests, and 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 quite. Um, um, uh, neatly uh, calculate how much the person had to drink and all these other effects. With cannabis, no, you um, you can say whether it's a high level, which would tend to cause impairment of THC, but you can't really say what they had to smoke or eat, uh, when they had it, who gave it, to, things like that. So it's a lot more complicated with um, which THC, but you can still talk about impairment at, at higher levels. With alcohol, it's much easier. It's so well established, um, but it makes it easier for the medical legal situation that we have the criminal limits. So two to five nanograms and greater than five nanograms. So if you go to a, say a jury and you say the deceased who was driving a car had uh, 25 nanograms of THC per milliliter of blood, they can adjust it that well, our high limit is five nanograms. So he's five times the limit. Whereas before we had all the criminal code things, you know, you couldn't really talk about limits and impairment, but there, it makes it a little bit easier. Just like 80, when you say someone uh, uh, drove at 160, the jury and people automatically know it's twice the, the legal limit. He, he, he was impaired, highly impaired, and that uh, caused the risk of, of accident. But by far, um, so far, the, the worst drug for driving and that you'll encounter is alcohol. There was one study in the States uh, where they looked at fatally injured drivers, and they found that if a person had THC on board, they were twice as likely to become fatally killed in an accident. So there is a risk and double risk is not nothing to laugh about per se. If the person had alcohol on board, the risk of being involved in a fatal motor vehicle accident was 16 times as much, much, much greater risk than for THC. And the problem, and this is another problem Mary will have, not besides edibles, but also combination of alcohol and THC. Combine alcohol and THC, the risk becomes 25 times that level. So um, it's bad to combine um, alcohol, beer, and grass at, uh, at any time, especially for driving. Um, the risks go up tremendously. Yeah, that's not, I was just going to ask you about combining things together because what happens is, you know, alcohol is not mutually exclusive to cannabis. Yeah. And I would say a lot of times people mix the two together, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so and they should be about, aware of, as you're indicating, the, the very increased risk. So, I mean, if you're used to smoking one Merrick cannabis cigarette, and six hours later, you drive, you're okay. It, it may be different than if you're smoking and, and bringing, you know, a dozen beer or so. Right. Now, does, um, for example, an overdose of alcohol um, has effects, for example, on the heart and things like that. And what about an overdose? To, like, how is an overdose in cannabis versus is different? Like, how is it different than alcohol? Um. Well, typically, if the person's healthy and um, um, they um, have no uh, risk factors such as cardiac arrhythmia and other problems like that, 
uh, the body can tolerate high doses of alcohol. The problem will be the behavioral thing. So, it, so the person, like I talked about, ate the whole whole cookie. THC didn't cause his death. Basically, he he would his heart was still pumping. He was still breathing. He was okay, but it caused a psychosis that he fell off the bridge, uh, off the uh, the hotel, and died. So indirectly, it was a, the cause of death. So THC as a direct cause of death is very limited. Um, there are some indications of people who have um, uh, heart problems. There is one, I think, in, in Nova Scotia, but he was, he was uh, survived. And basically what it was, it was a lollipop. And he was told that it would help his arthritis. Uh, the lollipop contained 90 milligrams of THC. His friend just got it, gave it to him, said, try this. So he ate the whole lollipop. He started developing heart palpitations and all sorts of um, arrhythmias and problems. And luckily he was taken to hospital. And, he, and as long as he was supportive, as long as he kept his heart beating and his and oxygen going, he was okay and he survived. And that's typically what happened. But if you don't, if you do have, you know, if you, the older you get, basically, the more risks the THC will have, especially if you have any type of heart issue. Mm hmm yeah, that makes but sense. in general, it's a lot safer than alcohol. Yeah, and I think, well, I, I think a lot of people know that um, there are medical uses. Oh, I guess there's medical uses for alcohol too, but um, yeah. I, I think a lot of people accept the fact that um, cannabis is helpful to people with uh, epilepsy, I think, and possibly multiple sclerosis. Are there other areas too? Yeah, but those, those that's been mainly CBD. Okay, the CBD. So they use CBD. So that's, yeah, that's quite well, because basically... Again, you don't want a young child who's having epilepsy to be given high doses of THC. That's going to change their brain. They're given high doses or they're given CBD. And so that's the care. But what happens is, is a lot of countries have banned hemp and cannabis, lumped them all together. So even the beneficial CBD, which doesn't cause any impairment, will not cause any problems in the society or in impaired driving, is banned along with THC. So that's the advantage you have by legalizing, as we have in Canada and in numerous U.S. states. Have there been any, uh, I, I thought I heard something in, on the radio uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago or something like that, but it had to do with a case where there was some argument between whether or not somebody was actually uh, impaired by t the cannabis or THC. And so and it had to do with, you know, you can, like alcohol, I guess like alcohol maybe, you know, you can have a certain level in your blood, but it's, but people may be different. So you may not be impaired. So what, you know, 0.08 with one person is not 0.08. It doesn't have the same effect as somebody else. And is, is that still an issue or is it pretty much um, pretty well, fairly well? Yeah, known? it still will be an issue. I mean, with alcohol, when I started years ago, they, they were using the same argument that, um, so point of, well, I have 0.08, big deal. I have a high tolerance to alcohol. And in all the research of alcohol has shown that it doesn't matter what your tolerance is. And the law is written in Canada that your ability to operate a motor vehicle is impaired. So your ability may be a bit better than some old, little old lady who, who does it. But with uh, uh, your ability of, with 0 0.08 is impaired to your sober ability. And you're at an increased risk of causing accidents. So uh, basically, we've gone around uh, in alcohol from looking at finger to notes test and seeing if the person uh, you know, can say uh, Episcopal Canadian or whatever it is, to looking at the level by a breath test or a blood sample or a urine sample. And we know if the person is over 80, actually over 50, there is an increased risk of a motor vehicle accident. And the various symptoms are affected, especially at night. It affects um, vision and that at night and your ability to, to operate at night. And that's a lot of times when the accidents happen. So um, the same arguments with cannabis. We're still, we, we will still have uh, fights about this in court. And that's uh, you know, something to look forward to, to see what's happening. Because we fought all this out in court in, uh, for you know, 20 years with alcohol and finally got everything settled down. Uh, with cannabis, will be the same thing. There'll be people who say there's no impairment, and and in some ways, the criminal code is not saying there's impairment. It just says you cannot have a blood THC greater than two nano, two to five nanograms, or greater than five nanograms. It doesn't care about whether you can walk a straight line or not. So, in some ways, it's an issue that um, doesn't matter because the, the all the research has shown that with these levels of greater than two nanograms, there is an increased risk of a motor vehicle accident in the general population. Yeah. Um, I wanted to move into uh, opioids a little bit, just to touch on them. Uh, and, um, you know, I was I was reading up on them quite a bit, uh, you know, in anticipation of, of you coming here. And I was really surprised. I didn't realize that, you know, the U.S. and Canada are right at the top of the list in terms of number of opioid deaths. So it yeah. seems like it's a serious problem. Yeah, it's the same. Uh, basically, I think it was the same company that promoted um, opioid use. 
and said it wasn't addictive, almost like tobacco companies that initially said put a cigarettes and said it's not addictive. You know, I mean, they, there's a, a you know a great thing where it shows. Um, I think it was the seven top CEOs of the t tobacco companies, 1970 or something, all swearing under oath with their hands up that nicotine was not an addictive drug. Meanwhile, all their lab research is with all the you know rats and and things have shown how addictive it is, and they were developing cigarettes to make it even more addictive. So horrendous uh, thing. The same thing happened in Canada and the United States. Um, I'm not, I forget the name of the company, but it's been had lawsuits in the United States and Canada have been found guilty. And they've been promoting, again, um, opioids um, and abuse of opioids. So people, um, there's been doctors that prescribed, you know, huge amounts of opioids to a person for pain. And of course, it's being abused and it's taken out and, you know, they sell it uh, to other people. So there was, um, again, started with the companies trying to get people addicted, basically, to do the drug. And they made millions and millions and billions of dollars on the, the, the drug. But it just caused devastation among the, especially the rural community. And opioids are a very addictive drug. It's, um, it's, it's, and also what's happening is it's the opioids are becoming stronger and stronger, just like cannabis has gone from, say, 4% to 17, 20% THC. The opioids have gone from just say simple morphine to fentanyl and all these other much more addictive and more uh, a drug that gives them a greater high. So a lot of the opioids now are cut with fentanyl, with, uh, which are even more uh, addictive. And fentanyl can be manufactured in a lab quite uh, readily. So that's the problem. The, the, the companies spread the use of opioids. People got it more addicted to it. They, um, um, the um, the uh, drug lords or whatever got involved in that were able to make the addictiveness go up. And um, now we have the problems of the deaths to the opioids in Canada is tragic. I mean, especially as more you know, younger people, uh, it's about six to 7,000 a year. Um, in a forensic lab, such as mine in Toronto, you'd be doing a couple opioid deaths at least a month. Mm -hmm. When I started, you seldom do a, an opioid death, uh, you know, 30 years ago. Now it's quite common because fentanyl is so, is so toxic. Um, but you also have to look in the context. I mean, um, nicotine uh, and tobacco related deaths in Canada are about 30, 30 to 35,000 deaths a year compared to six to 7,000. So it's about four to five times. So I'm not poo pooing the opioid epidemic, but I think the newspapers are focusing that, that too much. We still have problems with the addiction of nicotine and people dying from tobacco products. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't realize the, uh, the the nicotine was that high. The numbers were that high. Um, you hear a lot on the news about the opioid crisis, for example, in Vancouver or maybe in some other areas. Um, but you know, nobody really talks about nicotine. So, um, is is it just are you, are you when you say that there are deaths from nicotine? Are you saying there's it's an overdose death or is it? No, is no, it it's related to smoking. So basically, like it, it's, cancer. The thing is, it's 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 not a death that occurs right away. It tends to occur with older people. And so the, the problem of opioids is it gets rid of a lot of young people's lives and it gets rid of them right away uh, rather than poor. In some ways, um, the death is not as uh, lingering as it is for for uh, tobacco related deaths and cancers. Um, so but I just like to you know em emphasize that tobacco hasn't gone away. It may, may seem to go in the background and the media doesn't seem to be focusing anything on it, but it still is a is a. Um, a, a large uh, cause of death and uh, morbidity in, in Canada and the United States. And the, the tobacco companies seem to get around, you know, they're getting around with vaping now and they have, um, you know, all sorts of websites um, that will promote vaping is safe. Uh, vaping is just water vapor. It's harmless and things like that. And so it takes a while for the government to react and for Health Canada to get out the message about what the problems are with vaping and to regulate it like cigarettes. Because mm -hmm. for a while know? there was you had you could get it in the corner stores, you know they had big signs in the corner stores. So I was um, when when that first happened, I I refused to take my grandchildren to the like you could just go to the corner store to get candy, and then they're now they were exposed for quite a while for about you know four or five months to huge vaping signs, you know vaping because cigarette signs are not allowed to be displayed in the stores, mm -hmm. but vaping signs were allowed, and you actually saw billboards I think uh, uh, promoting vaping before just that period of time when when the government didn't act fast enough to, to stop it and that's what's happening all the time do we know where the source of uh like a lot of the street drugs opioids and things like that are from now or is just is clandestine labs and stuff are just making this stuff or are people actually getting pharmaceutical grade stuff and passing it around 
Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't think they can get farm. I don't think you can get a prescription for fentanyl. That's strictly controlled in the hospitals. But you can. There's all sorts of clandestine labs which can manufacture. I think initially it came from China. I'm not sure um, how much comes from China anymore, whether they're controlling it better. But you can build up a lab, you know, relatively easy and produce this product mm. or a horrible the, drug, actually. Um, and what do we know about the interaction of uh, some of these opioids with other things? Because just like you said, you know, uh, cannabis and alcohol but i'm sure people will also be you know doing alcohol and some other heroin or, or something else um, yeah um well when you do um alcohol and opioids is a bad that the potentiation is is much greater so you would mm -hmm. see a, a much greater effect of impairment um staggering and all the other effects uh, with um, that would compound the effects of uh, morphine or the opioids Okay. Um, I understand that uh, I, I heard on a, on a, I think it was a podcast or something that you can sell cannabis. Is that true? <laughs> you can, you can smell cannabis? No, no. Sell, sell, sell. <laughs> um, ooh. Yeah. I'm not sure the ins and outs are legal. You can grow for cannabis plants. I know that. I don't think you can sell it unless you have a license. I mean, well, so, you, so as long as you go to Health Canada, right. go through all the rigmarole, show that you're growing a secure area and, and may, sell, may all these other things, you can, you can sell it. But it's quite a, um, a long process to do it. But in general, you can grow four plants and you can uh, use it yourself without any problem. Just like you can uh, ferment your own beer and make your own wine. Um, you can also grow your own cannabis. Right. But I understand you took some kind of a course some time back. Is it some kind of a course for selling or, or like? Uh, oh, for that, a cannabis course. Yeah, that was the, oh, yeah, yeah. That was the, um, yeah, you're, when you're meaning is I can sell it legally. Yeah, so I can go in a shop. All the people who are working in the cannabis stores across Canada have to have a, a can serve, just like you have the, uh, the the serving for alcohol. So you you take a course and you, you uh, it's online and you pass it. Um, I had no problem, of course, but um, so I actually, you're right. I, I have my can serve certificate. So if I went in a cannabis store, I could um, I could legally sell it, um, but only in that store and not for my own. I couldn't bring my own four plants and sell that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you couldn't. Um, I was going to ask you, what's there, there's another one that I heard of and maybe I'm just out of touch here, but uh, it's I think is it is it carfentanil? Is it carfentanil? Yeah, that's more uh, even more toxic than fentanyl. Is that like the new kid on the block now? Is that recent? Um, supposedly, uh, they're they're seeing it more and more. But I, you know, don't work at a forensic lab anymore, so I haven't seen what the st statistics are with it. Right. Well, look, uh, we're kind of getting on in time here, but I do want people to uh, you know have a look at your website and stuff like that. And uh, so, look, folks, if um, if you get a chance, I'll put up the link here. Uh, to James' website, and it's Wigmore on alcohol. And actually, uh, James, can you talk about the the books you've got here? Because there's a few things here going on. Uh, what can you tell us about some of the writing that you're doing, and what's uh, what you've done, and what's coming up? Well, basically, it's it's um, looking at the medical legal aspects of these two drugs, uh, uh, alcohol, and then my more recent book was on cannabis. That was around the time of legalization. And what I do is I look at all the um, peer-reviewed published studies on these drugs, human studies. So I don't do deal with anything with animal studies or mouse studies or rat studies. And I uh, put them into all sorts of different uh, chapters um, like um, you know absorption, distribution, elimination. I uh, do a, a summary of the paper. I um, put them in proper order and things like that. So people and, and lawyers and judges and that can, um, can have a look at it and understand the basic principles of the drugs by peer reviewed published uh, uh, studies. And um, actually, it's, it's become quite popular, Wigmore and alcohol. Um, I had an a, a email from Sardinia uh, just the other day, and he showed me the Sardinia uh, Forensic uh, Medical Legal Library, and there were my books prominently displayed. Uh, he, says, uh, he said, the judges in Sardinia really like you. Um, they like your book and they, they, because I get rid of all sorts of misconceptions. It's just like with any science. It, there's a lot of nonsense about uh, alcohol um, uh, will cause this. Like if you have if you cut your tongue or something, you'll get a false high breath result. Or, um, you know, if you um, uh, breathe a certain way, you'll, you'll uh, get a low result or you'll get rid of alcohol faster. So it's basically just um, trying to do it to a layman's way um, in looking at medical legal aspects. Yeah, interesting. Well, if people want to reach out to you, are, you're also on LinkedIn, I believe. That's um, right. And if anyone's interested in forensic toxicology, if you want to link in, for, for, it's fine with me. I'll, I'll link in with you. 
Excellent. Well, look, um, I really appreciate your time. That's very, very informative. And uh, yeah, a lot of information here that uh, in, 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 in doing this talk, I, I learned a ton of stuff about uh, nicotine and, and that sort of thing. I mean, I don't smoke or anything, so you know, it's not very familiar to me. But yeah, I really appreciate all the work that you're doing and um, you know, a good, good job on the books and everything else. I really appreciate your time. Oh, thank you. Excellent. Thanks well, I'll tell you what. Me. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, hang back and I'll, I'll come and chat with you in just a second. I'm just going to make some closing comments. All right, folks. Well, that's it. That does it for this uh, episode. And uh, some really interesting information there. I, 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 uh, I always learn uh, a lot when I do these ones that are way out of my wheelhouse, so to speak. So uh, I want to thank everybody. I know there was a ton of questions here, but we're kind of getting on a little bit in time. So I apologize if I couldn't get through um, all the questions. I did try to phrase some of the questions so that we would cross over with some of the things you had there. Um, so uh, I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, don't forget that there is the uh, Click 3D Photogrammetry course that's coming up. You can just go to my website and check that out. And also there is the IAFSM conference. So that's going to be IAFSM.org. And then you'll be able to find out even more. Okay, folks, uh, that is it. I want to thank you all very much. And we'll see you soon. See you next week, actually. Take care. Bye-bye.